But we're going to start, as we always have with these conference previews, with my top five storylines. Some of these are declarations. Some of these are, well, questions. And I start with this one. Number one, is Utah going to make its first trip to the college football playoff? Man, better now than any other time. And I'm going to unpack that throughout the course of this show. But I wrote about Utah in my top 25 preseason ranking on the Fox Sports app. Please go check that out. Over there, where I rank them number five, I make reference to 14 of their 22 starters are back to this year's squad, including starting quarterback Cam Rising. They're expecting Mohamed Diabate to fill that role left by Devin Lloyd. He's coming from Florida. They have a non-conference game this year that opens against Florida. I'm excited to see what that looks like. But it's also about who Utah has been over the last, really, 20 years, but especially since Kyle Whittingham has been in charge. Going back to 08 when they ran the table undefeated, they beat Alabama in a bowl game, and nobody wanted to say anything about it. There is this real divide that we have about Utah and its place in college football and just how good they have been playing. I've been saying for some time that the Utah Utes played outstanding football. They're just not really good at branding themselves and letting everybody know about this. But they had an opportunity to do that last year when they were able to double up Oregon in 13 days and then give Ohio State the business in the Rose Bowl just as Ohio State was able to pull that out with a generational game by Jackson Smith and Jigba, who had 347 yards receiving in that game. But again, we're talking about Kyle Whittingham having a decision to go for it, kick a field goal, those sorts of things toward the end of the game as to whether or not they won that one. I think that Utah is the Pac-12's best hope to get into the college football playoff, but that also means that Utah is probably going to have to run the table because so many people are already out on Utah. I have them ranked number five. The AP preseason poll has them ranked at number seven. You can work with that. That's not... That's not terrible, right? Even if you started outside the top 25, I still think you can work yourself into the college football playoff if you're a Power 5 program, but that would get me off on another tangent that we just don't have time for today. Number two on this list, will Lincoln Riley win 12 games, the conference title, produce the Heisman winner at quarterback, and make the college football playoff in year one at USC, just like he did at Oklahoma? All right, so there's a lot to unpack there, but you can see I laid it on pretty thick. Because Lincoln Riley made his debut to much acclaim. Now, Oklahoma fans would be the first people to tell you he inherited a damn good football team in Norman when Bob Stoops tapped him at just the right time for Lincoln Riley to succeed as a 33-year-old head coach turning 34 at the start of the season. Now, I know that Lincoln Riley can coordinate an offense. We know that he can, at the very least, put out a quarterback that knows how to play. And this year, it is going to be Caleb Williams. We know this because he brought him to Pac-12 Media Days. And Caleb Williams, when he is on, is outstanding. Problem with that is when he's not on, he's not outstanding. There's not really any middle ground with this dude so far, but he was also a true freshman last year. Let's allow for some growth. Now, the offense is also going to have Travis Dye, who was an outstanding tailback, rushed for damn near 1,300 yards at Oregon last year. Jordan Addison coming from Pittsburgh, who was the reigning Bolitnikoff Award winner. Mario Williams, who Caleb Williams has a great rapport with. It's about whether or not the offensive line is going to be as good as it was last year and how healthy it could stay because they're just not that deep over there. But half the staff from Oklahoma is at USC, or half the staff from Oklahoma last year is at USC this year. Aside from the Utah Utes are probably feeling some kind of way about you, me, and the like having all these nice things to say about a program that went 4-8 and eight as they stomped a mud hole in the Pac-12 and walked it dry. I think that Lincoln Riley has an opportunity to make some waves here, but I do not think they're going to win 12 games. I do not think they're going to have the Heisman winner at quarterback, and I don't think they're going to make the college football playoff in year one. Now, that doesn't mean it doesn't happen down the line, but down the line, it's also in the Big Ten. So if you can't do it this year or next year, you got to do it against Ohio State, Michigan, Michigan State, Penn State, Iowa, Minnesota, Wisconsin. You get what I'm saying here? Like, I, I'm not seeing a whole hell of a lot of college football playoff spots for SC if they don't put it together quick, fast, and in a hurry. If you put it together quick, fast, and in a hurry, especially with the 2023 class you have coming in, you have an opportunity to be outstanding and to roll in the Big Ten and call some shots. Be a shot caller. But you got to do it right now. That's why I think this year one is going to be so interesting. We're all wanting to see what Lincoln Riley was running from Oklahoma to in USC, calling it the place where he thinks it could be the mecca of college football. 
I would like to see it. Two, can you produce? Let's see if they can produce. Number three on this question list for me, the storyline list for me, top five storylines, is BYU a college football playoff contender? All right. So my take on this is the Cougs have won at least 10 games in the last two, ten, uh, two seasons, right? Period. I think they got 21 wins over the last two years. Kalani Stocky is in position to get 30 and 3 with Jaron Hall returning. He had 23 touchdowns and just five interceptions last year. If they find a steady replacement for Tyler Algier, they'll be okay. Uh, Tyler, like Abram Smith at Baylor last year, is one of my favorite running backs of 2021. Why? Because both of those dudes came from linebacker to play tailback and were outstanding. All right? More, like, normalize more linebackers becoming tailbacks because apparently they just know that they want the contact. And what do you want at tailback? Somebody that wants to contact. Somebody knows they're going to probably get hit, but also would like to do the hitting. Problem with BYU in the 2022 season is that on its independent schedule, there's a bunch of Pac-12 stuff. Matter of fact, the joke was last year BYU would have been your Pac-12 champion and not Utah had they been in the Pac-12 last year because they were stopping a mud hole in Pac-12 teams. This year, they got those Pac-12 teams and Notre Dame. Yikes. Arkansas. Yikes. And then we talk about Oregon and Baylor. Yikes. So you have a Fiesta Bowl entrant. A team that won the Outback Bowl in nine wins for the first time in a decade. And quite frankly, one of my favorite college football teams in Arkansas. And Baylor, who put together an outstanding season, won the Big 12 championship, and won the damn Sugar Bowl against Ole Miss. If Brigham Young University can run that gauntlet, hell yes, they're going to make the college football playoff. Like, I just, did you hear me? I said Notre Dame, Arkansas, Oregon, and Baylor. What else do you need to see from them now? You need to see him win. That's that's the thing, right? You need to see him win because 10 games ain't going to get you in the college football playoff. Or I should say 10 wins is not going to get you in the college football playoff. You knock off all those teams. I don't give a damn how good or bad Arkansas or Notre Dame turn out to be. You're going to be sitting pretty because everybody understands what those programs are and who those programs have been over the past half day, uh, uh, half century to 100 years. This is why I actually have to say something about leaving Michigan out of my top 25 and not UTSA. Okay, I don't like the rules, but them's the rules. My next question on this top four side story, this top five storylines list, RJ Enunciate, you're a damn broadcaster. Can Dan Lanning return Oregon to heights it hasn't seen since Chip Kelly roamed the sidelines in Eugene? Okay, I make that reference because Oregon made the college football playoff, right? They also had a Heisman Trophy winner in Marcus Mariota who is going to start for the Atlanta Falcons this year. I, You know what? I'm going to leave the NFL stuff to the NFL people. I'm going to say that Mario Cristobal didn't do a bad job at Oregon. He just did not reach the heights that I think even he wanted to reach at Oregon, which is to say, make the damn college football playoff. It ain't enough to win the Pac-12 championship anymore because we don't respect it. That's what this season is about for the Pac-12. Getting the respect of the rest of the country. We don't give a damn. And we've shown that we don't give a damn because we're perfectly fine leaving the Pac-12 champion out of every single college football playoff since 2016. And even then, it was the Washington team that was a sacrificial lamb to Alabama. And not just Alabama, an Alabama team for which Lane Kiffin was calling offensive plays they had not run in the lead up to practice. And they still beat the brakes off the Huskies, all right? That is what you're contending against. That is what Dan Lanning has signed up for. At Oregon. Now, what he has going for him is an offensive coordinator that he has a great rapport with in Kenny Dillingham, who has partnered himself with, I think it's going to be Bo Nix as a starter. And Bo Nix played terrible football for all of 59 minutes and 30 seconds against Oregon and Justin Herbert and pulled out a win at Auburn. And Auburn ain't been anything to actually brag about since Cam Newton was playing quarterback over there. The one or two times they were able to beat Nick Saban wasn't good enough. That's why I guess Miles on is at Central Florida. He also has with him Tosh Lapoy, who I think is an outstanding defensive line coach and defensive coordinator. He's going to be coordinating the defense for Oregon. And he's got some outstanding players over there. On that list of outstanding players, you're going to talk about Noah Sewell. I know you're going to talk about Noah Sewell because he's been the best defensive player they've had for the last two years. But the guy you should be talking about has been one of my favorite recruits since he got into college football. That is Justin Flo whose nickname in high school was Baby Man. Why? Because Justin Flo was out here ragdolling people. Like, 
I have this running list of players on my all-time favorite defense that basically is like a tree of Vontez perfect style dudes. The kind of man that will walk up over the line of scrimmage, point at Mac Barkley, and say, I'm about to ruin you because it's like that. That's who Justin Flo is. Now, Justin Flo has also only played 15 quarters of football since getting to Oregon three years ago. But when he got to start against Fresno State, which also was a damn good football team last year, he had 14 tackles in that game and a forced fumble, which means he was the first Oregon player since 2007 to have 14 tackles and a forced fumble in the same game. Hello? You get Justin Flo and Noah Sewell playing outstanding defense in the middle of your defense. You're going to have outstanding defensive play. Ergo, you have an opportunity to win a bunch of football games. But more than that, you're going to be in every football game you play, which is going to be the landscape for Ducks football. As much as it's going to pain my homie Jeff Schwartz to hear, y'all might be up a creek in Eugene. Okay? You're going to need to be running like Prefontaine out in Eugene because your non-conference schedule, unlike Michigan's, is a death march. All right? Like, let me put it this way. Okay? Your non-conference schedule at Oregon is at Georgia. I'm calling it at Georgia because they're playing in Atlanta, and I, I refuse to give Georgia a neutral site on that. That's just – that's asinine. Let's not be stupid about this. Eastern Washington, and then, my goodness – BYU. All right. So what that means is Oregon non-conference schedule includes a 10-win FCS team, a 10-win FBS team, and the defending college football playoff national champions. That's your non-conference, homie. If you run that gauntlet 3-0, and yes, you are the number one team in the country by my standards. I mean, you would have beaten the number three team according to the AP. One of the best FCS teams in America and a top 25 Brigham Young University. Tall task, Dan Lanning. This is what you want. 36-year-old first-time head coach. Here. Have at it, sir. All right. My last question, top five storylines that I'm looking for in the Pac-12. Can the Pac-12 prove it's a power five conference in more than name only? This is a big deal for me, right? Because now would be an outstanding time. For the Pac-12 to remind us all that there's good football that's being played on the West Coast. All right? Because over the past five years, you have been skunked in the college football playoff. Your best team usually takes an unlikely L to a bad team in the Pac-12. All right? Last year, Oregon manages to beat Ohio State on the road. That's a gift. And how does Oregon and the Pac-12 respond to that gift? By giving up the booty to Stanford in a bad year for Stanford. You can't have that. You can't have teams cannibalizing each other in this Pac-12 if you expect to get into the college football playoffs. Another reason why they were smart to get rid of divisions because now you have a better opportunity to get one of your two best teams into the playoff because they'll have to have played each other as opposed to the North, which has not been great, to the South which is kind of fine depending on which year you expect USC, Arizona State, and Utah to be good. Okay, on top of that, when you get to the Rose Bowl and you're able to demonstrate to us that you could play with Ohio State, a team we all pretty much have a high confidence in, cool, that's a great look. So, I'm saying that the 2022 fate and future of the Pac-12 is very much on the Utah Utes because they have the built-in reputation advantage They will play all of the teams that we care about, right? And at least one that we know about, Florida, in its non-conference schedule. And then if they're able to run the table, win the Pac-12 championship, I don't see how you're going to leave them out. Especially if your Big 12 champion has a loss or your ACC champion has a loss. I think both the Big 10 and the SEC are just going to get teams in. That's the way that this league is going. And that's kind of been my whole bent with this 2022 season. One of the things I learned from y'all, one of the things I learned from the sport is, much as I want the sport to change and be more fair and equal and have some parity, you don't. And you don't particularly care about that. What you care about is whose reputation has what. If you build a reputation up over time, like Utah, we're going to honor that down the line. This is what Cincinnati had to do last year. They had to beat people for three straight years before we were like, cool, we'll let you into the college football playoffs so that Alabama can beat the brakes off you. And then RJ will shut up at talking to us about group of five teams getting into our 14 playoff. Fine. If that's what it's got to take, that's what it's got to take. 
So, Utah, you got to come through, which is an answer to one of these questions that I'm going to give you a little bit later on. Thanks for watching this video. And remember, hit that subscribe button so you don't miss any other videos on the number one ranked show YouTube channel.